speaker series we meet every Monday during the academic year uh, in this room at this uh, at this time I'm just going to give you a preview of uh, the next two talks before introducing today's speaker so next week Sarah Benson Amron is coming from the University of Wyoming and the following week uh, October 22nd Eduardo Amaram is coming he's uh, in genetics and is a, a postdoc down in ecology and evolutionary biology uh, so I'm very pleased to introduce Michael Rascola, who's a professor here in uh, in our philosophy department, and we're excited to hear his talk. Thank you very much. Um, I wasn't quite sure what to deliver today as remarks because I didn't quite know what sort of audience was. Just just for my benefit, um, like what departments are people from? Just so I have some. Is people, are people from anthropology or? Um, so mainly from anthropology, and then any from psychology or evolutionary psychology, or so it's just mainly anthropology. A few. Okay, so that that was sort of what I expected. <laughs> I wasn't sure. Okay, well, so listen, I'm gonna um, just talk a little bit about um, philosophy of cognitive science and sort of some of the things that people work on in philosophy of cognitive science and how some of my work uh, fits into that broader scheme. And if I'm going too fast or too slow, or you know, just saying things that everyone knows, or so on, just I'll try to gauge that from looking at your faces, or maybe you can let me know. So anyway, we'll see how it goes. And I'm supposed to talk for 45 minutes yeah. to an hour about. Okay, yeah. so um, great. So I, I think that, and then we'll have questions. Uh, and then, do people usually ask questions as the talk is going on, or or is it just sort of as up typically to the, at the end? Typically yeah. at the end. Okay, yeah, that's how philosophy talks go. But then other. Disciplines have different norms. Okay. Well, you know, if you have some really burning clarificatory question, it, you know, just like feel free to jump in. But if you have like some devastating objection, then maybe it's going to close it at all. Um, all right. So um, one of the oldest ideas that people have had about the mind, uh, going back you know really thousands of years, is to think of the mind as a representational organ. So just as the part serves to pump blood or the stomach serves to digest food, the idea is that one of the mind's principal functions is to represent the world. And you, you, know, you see this by just reflecting on a few common sense examples. So say that I'm at Ralph's at the grocery store and I think, oh, you know what, I, I'm out of OJ at home. There's still some lemonade, but I'm out of OJ. So you've entered into a, a mental state, a, a belief state, that represents the world as being a certain way. Namely such that you know, there's OJ in your refrigerator, but not lemonade in your refrigerator. Or say that you realize, hey, I've got to mail this letter. I'm going to walk to the post office now, and I'm going to mail the letter. So you form an intention to <coughs> walk to the post office. Um, so now you, you have this intention, this intention, this mental state, represents the world as being a certain way, namely such that you're walking to the post office to mail the letter, and then the intention will be fulfilled or not, depending on whether or not you, you act on that intention and actually go to, go to the post office. So those are two examples in which you have a belief or an intention, they represent the world. Uh, and philosophers have historically agreed that this is you know, one of the central facts about the mind that, that it represents. Um, and that you know you have to really zone in on this representational aspect in order to understand how the mind works. So, like, for example, if you want to understand why did I walk to the post office instead of the grocery store, the fact that my intention represented me as walking to the post office and not to the grocery store is obviously going to be pretty crucial for that. It's how you represented the world as being that helps to determine how you act. Now, the most common way that people um, have sought to develop this this representational picture of the mind is by positing entities, mental representations, mental items that represent. Um, and the idea is these mental representations are sort of like the communal representations that we use in everyday human society, like sentences, maps, pictures, calendars, diagrams. So they're sort of like them, but they're housed in the mind rather than the external world. And these items, these mental representations, can be stored in memory, they can be manipulated during mental activity, and they can be combined to form complex representations. So this is usually called the representational theory of mind. That the representational theory of mind is just the view that these mental representations exist. Uh, this is a very old view. Uh, you find it in the medieval era. In the medieval era, many people such as, uh, for example, William of Ockham, posited what they called a language of thought, or a mentalese. And here, this, this, this mental language, mentalese, 
what is supposed to be sort of like a human language that we speak. It has words and sentences that can be combined together. Um, but um, it's a mental, not uh, linguistic, but sorry, mental as opposed to um, uh, spoken. Um, so for example, there would be like a mental word, dog, that represents dogs, and a mental word, furry, that represents the property of being furry, and then you can combine together that mental word, dog, the mental word, furry, to form a mental sentence, dogs are furry, which represents that dogs are furry. All right, this was a, you know, sort of a commonly accepted view in the, in the medieval era. In, it, as the centuries progressed, but sort of around the, um, what the philosophers called the early modern era, which is essentially sort of around the, you know, some, somewhere in the 17th century, early mid 17th century. Um, this, this way of looking at it became less popular, the mental language picture. People still believed in mental representations. They, they just didn't analogize them anymore to um, linguistic entities, to, to items from a natural language. So it, that, now the preferred terminology became idea. So if you look at a lot of the philosophical writings from this era, like people like Descartes and Locke, um, they'll talk about ideas. But so what they mean by ideas is mental representations. Um, but I'm not really think of, thinking of them in linguistic terms. I wanted to read you just a quote from Locke. This is a quote from the beginning of um, an essay concerning human understanding. Um, here's what Locke says about this. Idea seems to be the best word to stand for whatever is the object of the understanding when a man thinks. This is the not you know, politically correct language anymore. Um, I have used it to express whatever is meant by phantasm, notion, species, or whatever it is that the mind can be employed about in thinking. And I couldn't avoid frequently using it. Nobody, I presume, will deny that there are such ideas in men's minds. Everyone is conscious of them in himself, and men's words and actions will satisfy him that they are in others. And that's pretty much the extent of the argument you get for um, the existence of these ideas. And this is partly because it was just, you know, very, it was common coin in this area. Everyone pretty much accepted that there was something uh, li like this going on. And now, the way that Locke and a lot of the British empiricists, um, of whom Locke was one, tended to think of it, they, they thought of the idea as sort of more like a mental image. So, like, for example, um, an idea of a triangle would be something like a mental picture or a mental image of a triangle that you had in your head. That, that was more the sort of, so it was more like pictures as opposed to language was the preferred analogy. Now, ideas really continue to, to shape how people thought about the mind. And in the 19th century, when psychology split off from uh, philosophy as an autonomous discipline, you found a lot of the founding texts of psychology just helping themselves to the idea idea. So um, I'll just mention three examples. Um, Helmholtz's Treatise on Philosoph Physiological Optics, James's uh, The Principles of Psychology, and uh, Vunt's uh, Principles of, um, sorry, um, yeah, William James is the Principles of Psychology, and Vunt's The Principles of Physiological Psychology. Um, just three of the founding texts of psychology. Um, and all of them uh, put ideas at center stage. So for example, uh, Helmholtz especially, um, the idea in Helmholtz, he wants to understand uh, perception, he wants to understand, for example, if you look at a red sphere, how do you come to see it as being red and as being spherical? And he sort of takes it um, as a presupposition that what happens is you get an idea of redness, an idea of sphericality, and then he's trying to explain how those ideas are instantiated in your mind. And that's kind of part of the foundations of his, his whole setup. And then, but I mean, unlike philosophers who have talked about ideas, like people like Locke or Descartes. But Helmholtz was doing something a lot more scientific. I mean, it was, he had much, you know, he had like actual experiments and something much more systematic and, and theoretical. Um, so, so he was trying to embed this idea apparatus in, in a more uh, scientific setting. So, you know, for a while it sort of looked like that that was basically what was going to happen, was that you were going to have psychology, this new science of the mind, picking up on this framework that philosophers had been, you know, exploring, but now trying to make it more scientific, this idea of better representations. And that sort of <laughs> didn't happen for a long time, and a big reason for it was the rise of behaviorism in the early 20th century. So, you know, I assume that most of you are, are f familiar with this at least somewhat. Um, so, but you had people like um, B.F. Skinner and, you know, in, in America and Pavlov in, in Russia, who, who really wanted to... Um, get rid of mental representations. And, and in fact, you see this especially in Skinner's work. So Skinner's really skeptical just about really well, the mind altogether. 
So Skinner, you know, he thinks all this stuff about mental states, mental processes, let alone mental representations. That's all just this antiquated look at, way of looking at it. It's not scientific. Um, it's really sort of on a par with talking about witches and ghosts. And you find in Skinner this attempt to instead explain things in terms of like a stimulus response history. So stimulus and response becomes the key theoretical notion, and there's no internal mediating mental states. There are no representational mental states that play any kind of causal role in shaping uh, behavior. Um, now, that, and that prevailed for quite a while um, in basically the first half of the 20th century, nearabouts. Um, and really, it, it only changed around the 1960s with the cognitive science revolution. Um, so, um, let me just, when I, like, if I talk, if I say, for example, like, Noam Chomsky's book re review of Skinner's verbal behavior, do, do people, like, know when I'm talking about, some, some people know when I'm talking about, yeah, so, some do, some don't, okay. So, I mean, just, I, I'll just mention that. So, like, one, um, one of the sort of seminal events here was that so Skinner had published a book called Verbal Behavior, which attempted to a analyze, um, well, you know, language, verbal behavior, as the title says, in terms of stimulus response uh, history. And Chomsky published a very uh, scathing review of this book, where he argued that you know this was a complete failure, that the, just these so-called explanations that Skinner was giving didn't work at all. And he sort of pointed out very carefully that Skinner, when he was using these terms like stimulus and response in the context of explaining um, uh, verbal behavior by, by, by you know people. He was kind of really bending the terminology, not using it the way that he used it in his lab work on rats. Really, he was using it as sort of um, basically synonyms for the ordinary terms like belief, desire, intention that we would use. And he was kind of misusing his own scientific terminology and giving, trying, in effect, to replicate the ordinary um, folk psychological explanation you would give in his stimulus response terms. So I'll just read you, um, I'll read you a quote from this, this famous <coughs> review. Chomsky says, the way in which these terms are brought to bear in the actual data, brought to bear by Skinner, indicates that we must interpret them as mere paraphrases for the popular vocabulary commonly used to describe behavior, vocabulary like belief, desire, intention, and as having no particular connection with the homonymous, homonymous expressions used in the description of laboratory experiments. Naturally, this terminological revision adds no objectivity to the familiar mentalistic mode of description. So th this was a, a seminal event, this, this, this review by Chomsky in the history of 20th century psychology, because it really showed that, you know, here this is one area where the best attempt that anyone's given to develop this behaviorist view has committed a complete failure. And we really need to go back to a more mentalistic way of looking at things. And then in Chomsky's positive work that maybe some of you are familiar with, on generative grammar, he really extended this mentalistic view to explain, for example, our, you know, our grammaticality judgments, our judgments as to whether or not sentences are grammatical or not. So uh, this was, you know, in other words, work on natural language syntax. Um, and this, this, this work of Chomsky's, both his, his arguments against Skinner and then his more positive work in developing generative linguistics, sort of both exemplify and helped to fuel the, the cognitive revolution which occurred in the, in the 60s. Because what you found was that people were, were really much more self-consciously comfortable with talk about mental representations, talk about internal mental states, talk about belief, desire, and intention. And this was no longer seen as some sort of unscientific way of looking at it anymore. And in fact, it was, people concluded that really it was much more scientific to appeal to these notions because at least you got some sort of explanation of, of the, the target phenomena. Whereas with someone like Skinner, you, you really weren't, it, it, it was this sort of facsimile of an explanation to the extent that it was really a pure stimulus response explanation. Um, all right, so I, what you find in cognitive science is, is really um, um, the, the resurgence of this, this idea of mental representations, and that you have internal mental processes defined over these mental representations. So this picture that you had all along in the, in the philosophical literature and then that you had in the 19th century emergence of, of psychology. Um, and this is something that's emphasized by, you know, many of the foundational treatments of um, cognitive science. So, for example, among philosophers, one of the most um, influential treatments has, uh, was due to a philosopher named uh, Jerry Fodor. Um, so Fodor wrote a book called The Language of Thought in 1975, where he argued that basically we had to resuscitate this picture that you found in the medieval literature of an internal mental language. And he argued that if you looked at a lot of the um, best work being done in cognitive science, it was 
committed to something like a mental language and something like the sense that these medieval philosophers had had in mind. Um, and other uh, people more oriented in the scientific literature argued for uh, similar conclusions as, as well. Um, okay, so I wanted to talk a little more concretely then about um, two sort of case studies from cognitive science that illustrate this point. So I wanted to do that a little, uh, to just put a little more flesh on this skeleton I'm presenting, and then um, to, uh, then time permitting, we'll see how we're doing on time, to talk about some more philosophical ramifications of this. All right, so the first case study I want to talk about is uh, navigation, animal navigation. And I think I noticed on uh, your website, you had a talk just last week about, yeah, <laughs> um, about navigation. Um, so maybe, I'll, I don't know how many of you were there last week, but maybe I'll be repeating some of what was said. I, I think I may um, be disagreeing a little bit um, with what, what was said, though, based on my knowledge of, of, of um, that talk. Um, so... In 1948, uh, the Berkeley psychologist, uh, Edward Tolman, uh, published a paper called Cognitive Maps in Rats and Men. And Tolman had done experimental work with rats navigating through mazes. And he observed that these rats were able to uh, take novel detours and shortcuts through the maze when it was appropriate to do so. And he argued that the best explanation for this, this novel route-taking behavior was that the rats had internal metro representations that he called cognitive maps, which represented the spatial layout of their environment. In this case, the environment being the maze. Um, so that you could call cognitive maps because they were similar to the you know, maps that we use in everyday life. This suggestion did not go over well at the time. Uh, this was for a few reasons. First, there were some design flaws in uh, Tolman's experiment. So they, they were certainly up to, up to modern standards um, of rigor. And second of all, you know, this was 1948. This was still the heyday of behaviorism. So people really just like were not um, at all sympathetic to this idea. Um, but as the cognitive science revolution progressed, this idea started, the cognitive map hypothesis started to get a more sympathetic hearing. Um, so a really pivotal development here was uh, in the early 70s, this discovery of what are called placed cells. And basically a placed cell is a um, cell in the, uh, the rat hippocampus that responds selectively to a specific location in, in the environment. It, it fires selectively when, it's, when the rat is at a specific location. Now, it's, a, it's more complicated than that, but that to a first approximation is how these place cells work. All right, so now, <clears throat> that really like, astonished a lot of people because what it showed was that there was this, this thing in the rat's brain that systematically correlated with a very abstract geometric feature of the environment, namely spatial location. And, and people just simply had to believe that this, that this was what was going on until these place cells were discovered. Now, John O'Keefe was one of the people who discovered these place cells uh, that was in his lab. And O'Keefe and Lynn Nadell published a book in 1978 called The Hippocampus as a Cognitive Map, where they basically argued on the basis of this and other neurophysiological evidence, and they also brought together a lot of philosophical and behavioral evidence that you know, these cognitive maps that Tolman had um, postulated did indeed exist, um, and that they were, you know, essentially located in the rat hippocampus. Um, now, I, I think it's, you know, it's important um, not to overstate how much is established by the discovery of these place cells, because sometimes people will look at these place cells and then subsequently a lot of other neurophysiological uh, evidence has been discovered. So O'Keefe co-won the Nobel Prize with uh, the Mosers, who discovered so-called grid cells, which respond to more, even more abstract geometric features of the environment. So they place those grid cells. There are other types of cells that respond to other geometric features. But all, and sometimes people will say, oh, look, see there, we found the cognitive map, because there are these cells. But, you know, that's not really right for a number of reasons, just the most simple-minded of which is that the cognitive map is supposed to represent um, where landmarks are located, like, you know, where very, very salient objects are located in the environment. And these cells, none of these cells really do that. They all more are registering just 
the animal's current location, some abstract geometric feature of the animal's location. So you know, it's too simple just to say, ah, now we found the cognitive map. But still, it, it's obviously very suggestive that at the neurophysiological level, you get these correlations with abstract geometric features of the environment. It no longer seems so crazy <coughs> to suggest that maybe you actually have mental representation of abstract <coughs> geometric features of the environment. To my mind, though, the, the neurophysiological evidence is obviously very important, but I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat more impressed by um, the behavioral evidence. And you have a lot of behavioral work that's been done that um, basically uh, tries to take this Tolman's original argument from the 1948 paper and do it more rigorously, sometimes with rats, sometimes with um, other animals. So there's one experiment that some researchers in Israel did with bats, for example, where they took the bats, this is just from a few years ago, they took the bats, um, they took them from their home nest, they transported them like really far, like you know, 40 kilometers or even farther, to some, the location that the bats had never been to before. And then they release the bats, and at first the bats are disoriented, and then they sort of look around, uh, and these bats have, have relatively good vision for bats. And um, they're able to, you know, use salient landmarks, like distant city lights, to orient themselves, and then to fly back to the home nest, or sometimes they fly to a known food source, depending on if they're hungry or not. And this experiment was quite carefully set up to rule out a lot of you know, alternative explanations that you might be thinking of, like that they're, you know, following some route or that they're doing some kind of dead reckoning or things like this. It, it was quite carefully set up to try to rule out these alternative explanations. So, you know, there's quite a number of experiments like this, and, you know, I'm not going to, you know, I don't know if this is the appropriate time to go through all of them because I just want to sort of do this as a illustrative case study. But to my mind, at least, these um, experiments do demonstrate convincingly that at least in some cases you observe in mammals navigational phenomena that are best explained by positing mental representations that represent the spatial layout of the environment. You know, where the animal is located, where salient landmarks are, are located. Um, this, this case of um, cognitive maps is a good one, I think, to look at. First of all, because we understand a fair amount about their role in psychological activity. So we have pretty good theories of how mammals update their cognitive maps based on new experiences. Uh, for example, how animals uh, orient themselves if they get lost. So we have a sense of the psychological role of these cognitive maps. And second of all, as I was indicating to you, we know a decent amount about their neurophysiological implementation compared to other mental representations that have been posited. And, and what you do find in this, in this neurophysiological literature is that the cognitive map hypothesis is serving as a unifying postulate that really is guiding research. It's helping guide what they're looking for when they, when they do these neurophysiological experiments. So it's, it's, a, it's a crucial postulate that ties together the more psychological level of explanation with a more neurophysiological explanation. Now, I don't want to say that like everyone believes in these cognitive maps. So it, it's still somewhat controversial even in the case of mammals. But I do think that the majority opinion, the orthodox view, is that these cognitive maps exist, and that this is a pretty concrete case of where we have good evidence for mental representations. Uh, the second example I wanted to talk about uh, has to do with perception, which was, you know, as I mentioned, the, the case that um, that uh, Helmholtz uh, was originally focused on. So the, the question that Helmholtz was interested in, as I, as I mentioned, was how do you, does the perceptual system estimate distal conditions, condi conditions in the distal environment, the, the environment outside your body, based on proximal sensory stimulations, stimulations, say, of the retina. Okay. Uh, retinal stimulations are the example, easiest case to think about. But you could also have you know, vibrations of the inner ear, things like that. Those would also be proximal stimulations. And Helmholtz, um, really emphasize that this is a difficult problem to solve because, for example, if you have a certain retinal stimulation, there are really many possible environmental conditions that could have caused that retinal stimulation. Just, here's just a simple example. Let's say that you're seeing a convex bump on a wall and the light is coming from overhead. All right, well, that's going to cause a certain retinal stimulation. But you would have gotten the exact same retinal stimulation if the bump had been concave and the light had come from below. So. How does the perceptual system disambiguate that? How, how does it know what's going on? 
So Helmholtz's idea was that the perceptual system executes what he called an unconscious inference to, to try to arrive at the best hypothesis about distal conditions. And the idea is that these inferences draw about upon sort of implicit assumptions about how the environment is. So in this case, the implicit assumption would be that, well, light usually comes from overhead, not from below. It could come from below, but usually it comes from overhead. Now, this idea <clears throat> has really been taken on board by contemporary perceptual psychology. So in perceptual psychology, the dominant uh, modeling framework that people now use, it uh, uses um, what's called a Bayesian decision theory. Now, when I say, does anyone, like, raise your hand if you've heard of Bayesian decision theory. I don't know. Oh, good. Okay, great. So that, that's uh, excellent. See, I just, uh, coming from philosophy, you never know what, what, what people in other disciplines are going to So it's so terrific. So people sort of are familiar with it. So, you know, as you, as you know, then, with many of you, it's um, a mathematical framework for modeling um, reasoning and decision making under uncertainty. And the core notion is a uh, like degree of belief or subjective probability, like the probability of su that some outcome is the case. And these probabilities are subjective. They're not objective. In other words, they're facets, facets of the individual's psychology. They're not like objective chances or frequencies out in the world. Okay. So now Bayesian perceptual psychology uses the Bayesian framework to model perception. So the idea is Helmholtz was right. Perception is, doing, is an unconscious inference. It's an unconscious Bayesian inference. So the perceptual system has prior probabilities, prior assignments of subjective probability to various outcomes. So for example, it assigns higher probability to the hypothesis that light comes from overhead and not from below. And it then receives evidence. The evidence is proximal sensory input, like some retinal stimulation. Then it executes a Bayesian inference. And that's how it arrives at a perceptual state that represents the world as being a certain way. Uh, so you get quite detailed models in uh, Bayesian perceptual psychology that, that implement this idea. Detailed models, okay, well here's, the, here's what we're going to hypothesize at the prior at work in this particular perceptual task. And now here's my Bayesian model of how the perceptual system uses that prior to arrive at, you know, an estimate of, you know, the shape or the size or the color or the location of some object. So these are the sorts of perceptual distal properties that are treated in, in these models. And these models are quite explanatorily successful. They, they can explain, for example, a number of uh, perceptual illusions that are otherwise quite difficult to, to explain in, in any other framework. So th this is a quite um, dominant way of looking at it now, the Bayesian framework, because it's proved so powerful. Again, like, like everything in, in these areas, it's controversial. You have people arguing against it. But it's a quite popular way of looking at it. And I, I think there's quite a lot of um, evidence for it. So um, one point I wanted to make about this, this Bayesian framework is that it, it's really a thoroughly representationalist framework. It, it really uh, it enshrines this representationalist perspective on, on the mind. Um, <clears throat> now why is that? Well, the reason is that it, it's really built into the whole, the foundations of the Bayesian apparatus. Because it, so the Bayesian apparatus, the key idea is that you're assigning a subjective probability to a hypothesis, a hypothesis about how the world is. So you might like have a subjective probability of you know 0.7 that the Democrats are going to retake the House of Representatives. I think that's what Nate Silver has. He says something like 0.7 or 0.8 now. So like that's like my subjective <coughs> probability that the, that the Democrats are going to retake the House in, in, in a month. Okay, well now for me to be able to assign that subjective probability to to the the, the um, hypothesis that the Democrats are going to retake the House. I have to be able to represent the possibility that the Democrats are going to be able to retake the House, that the Democrats are going to retake the House. You can't assign a subjective probability to, you know, some possibility unless you can represent that possibility. So the, the, the sort of, it's built into the foundations of the Bayesian framework that you're dealing with some kind of mental representation. And when you see this also when you, when you apply it to, to the perceptual system. So, I, you know, think about um, a Bayesian model of perception. Say you have a Bayesian model of, you know, how the perceptual system estimates shape or size or color or location. So now, I mean, so in, when you set up the Bayesian model, you'll say, like, this is where I would have been the chalkboard, because I would have written down, you write down like P of H, right? The probability of H. All right, so just imagine I've written down like P, P parentheses H. So, um, well, yeah, I just, <laughs> Here we go. Impromptu P. Or P of, so you have P of H, right? 
Okay. All right, so that, that's the probability of it. But what is the age, right? What, what's age? It's a, it's, a, it's a hypothesis, right? So, so age is like the, the, you know, the hypothesis that the, um, you know, the, the light comes from overhead or that you might have a, the probability that an object is convex as opposed to concave. Um, well, I say H is a mental representation because it has all the properties that mental representations are supposed to have. First of all, it most fundamentally, it represents the world as being a certain way. So, you know, it's a, the probability that the object is convex. So H represents the object as being convex. And second of all, the, the percept, perceptual system, it performs mental operations on this hypothesis. It can attach a subjective probability to it. It can execute a Bayesian inference over it. It can select a hypothesis as its privileged hypothesis that then you know, goes into the final perceptual state. And also it can combine these hypotheses. So you could you know, have a Bayesian model of shape perception or color perception. So you'll have representations of shape, representations of color. And then these get combined into a unified perceptual state. So you could estimate, oh, the, the object is red. It's a sphere. It's a red sphere. So you combine together the representations of the color and the shape to get a representation of you know, the overall distal scene. So these hypotheses are mental items that, the, that, that represent and that the mind can store, manipulate, and combine. So that they have, these are the key properties that at the beginning I said mental representations are supposed to have. So the, the interpretation that I've argued for in, in my you know, work on this is that, is that, um, <clears throat> is that um, the Bayesian perceptual psychology is basically presupposing um, the existence of these mental representations and describing Bayesian inferences over them. So these are two case studies, the cognitive maps and the Bayesian perceptual psychology, which I interpret both as giving evidence for mental representations and as explanatorily crucial posits for understanding the mind. Um, now, you know, it, it, it sort of varies um, how much interpretation you have to do as opposed to just how much looking at the what the scientists actually say. So in, in um, the research on animal navigation, the cognitive map hypothesis was, it was cognitive maps were very explicitly construed as mental representations and that all along the debate has sort of been, should we posit these mental representations or not? The Bayesian perceptual psychology literature, people don't tend to call the hypotheses mental representations. They tend to focus more on the sort of the setting up the mathematics of the model and showing how it can explain. So you have to do admittedly a little more of a philosophical gloss on it, but I still think it's a a glass that one can defend. All right, so those are sort of two examples of this um, theme that I've been emphasizing of how cognitive science um, uh, really uh, gives scientific, lends scientific rigor to this old idea of mental representations. And I wanted to now, so we have a little bit of time, I guess we've got like 10, 10 to 25 minutes, depending how it goes, talk, up, talk about um, some of the more abstract philosophical questions that people have raised about uh, um, these mental representations. So <clears throat> I'll just begin by um, uh, saying something which is uh, pretty uncontroversial within the philosophical literature, which is uh, really, it, it goes back to um, ideas of, I mean, you find this in already like in Kant, but really, the first person to really hammer home was the 19th century logician, mathematician, philosopher, Gottlob Frege, um, who uh, is an extremely uh, influential figure in analytic philosophy. And the idea, I mean, because uh, this is a, uh, addressing the question, well, look, what does it even mean to talk about like a representation of a mental state, to say that a mental state is representing the world? What, what, what is that all about? And so the idea that uh, Frege pursued, you know, building on Kant, but he really um, was the first person to cleanly articulate it, is that the, ultimately when you talk about mental states representing the world, this is about whether the states can be assessed as veridical or non-veridical, or you could say accurate or inaccurate. So a mental representational mental state is, is, is associated with a veridicality condition, a condition under which the mental state is veridical. So for example, take my belief that the refrigerator contains OJ, but not lemonade. Okay, well then that belief is true only if my refrigerator contains OJ, but not lemonade. So the belief is true under some conditions, false under other conditions. 
And the idea is that that, that I mean, that it sounds almost like touristic when you put it, put it like that, but the idea is that this is sort of, should be, I mean, it's good to have touristic starting points in philosophy, because then you know at least that it's more likely to be right. So it's, I mean, it's, it's the idea is that the representational mental state sort of inflicts a division on logical space, that it says, look, here are the circumstances in which it's veridical, here are the circumstances in which it's not veridical. Or take my intention to walk to the post office. Well, now this now you don't want to talk about the, the intention being true or not. That doesn't sound right. You want to talk about the intention being fulfilled or not. So the inten I'll fulfill the intention if I do indeed walk to the post office. But if I just decide to stay home and you know watch TV or surf the internet or something, then the intention is not fulfilled. So that's another species of veridicality. So truth is one kind of veridicality. Truth is that it being vertical, false is not being being non-vertical. Fulfillment is another kind of veridicality. Because the, the essence of this is that you're looking at the representational mental state, you're looking at how it represents the world as being, it inflicts this division of logical space, and then you ask, does our actual you know, situation, where does it fall with respect to this division? Did things in fact turn out the way that the representational mental state uh, depicted it as, as being? So that, that's sort of the rough idea, is this idea of veridicality conditions as, as to the encapsulating how the state represents the world as being. And this is the idea that Frege pursued and that many other um, subsequent philosophers throughout the 20th and 21st century have pursued. Um, so you know you could apply this just as well to the cases I've been talking about. So for example, a kind of the map represents the environment as having a certain spatial layout. And then the map may be accurate or may not. And you know if it's accurate, that's going to be very beneficial for the animal. And if it's inaccurate, it may lead to problems for, for the animal. Um, <clears throat> all right, so I think that that's a useful um, uh, framing to, to have in, in mind. Um, and then, of course, if you, if you just leave it at that, that doesn't tell you much. But then the, the idea is to develop this into more systematic theories. And a lot of the work that's gone on in um, the philosophy of representation has, has, has been try attempting to do that. So here's an example of, of the kind of issue that comes up once you have um, the, that starting point in mind, which is the issue of the um, form of mental representation. So if you go back like to, to Aristotle, one of Aristotle's great ideas was the idea of logical form. That, so this is when you have the syllogism, like all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. And the, the idea was that you can sort of schematize the logical form of these um, sentences, and that gives you some insight into logical inferences over them. Now, Frege, uh, who I just mentioned, uh, was you know, the most important logician since Aristotle. And the reason for this was that he gave a much more penetrating analysis of logical form than uh, anyone previously had given. And he really, and he basically, he was the founder of modern logic, so the logic that's taught, you know, in every philosophy department across the country now is what Frege discovered. And the essence of this logic is that you schematize how the logical structure of a sentence or a thought contributes to the truth condition of the sentence, the conditions under which the sentence is true. So for example, is a simple, simplest example one could give. Say you have a sentence like, John is a biologist and Mary is a physicist. So that's a um, conjunction, John is a biologist and Mary is a physicist. So that sentence is true just in case each of the conjuncts is true. John must be a biologist, Mary must be a physicist. So you, both of the conjuncts must be true, and that's what it takes for the conjunction to be true. And now that's a very simple example, obviously, but what Frege showed was how you can give uh, kindred analyses for much more complicated examples. So you can have a sentence like, every biologist who admires some physicist is admired by some physicist, things like that. And you know, when we teach logic in, in an intro philosophy class, a lot of what we do is just be like, schematize the logical form of that. I'll, here's my sentence, write down the logical structure. Now, I mean, why do we do that? What, what, like, why do we make people do that? Well, one of the reasons is because when you've schematized the logical structure, you gain insight into how the, that's the structure of the sentence contributes to the representational import of the sentence. And that the essence of that insight is understanding how the, the, the semantic properties of the individual parts contribute to the, the conditions under which the overall sentence is true, to its truth condition. So, um, <clears throat> you know, you can, you can apply this, this Frege um, analysis of, of modern, you know, this founding of, uh, analysis of modern logic um, this, this schematization of logical form to gain insight into the, the format, the, the, the representational structure of 
sentences and by extension thoughts, the thoughts that are expressed by sentences. Because of course there's the sentence, you know, every biologist to admire some physicist is admired by some physicist. But that sentence expresses a thought and the thought also has a logical structure. So when you, when you analyze the structure of the sentence, you're also analyzing the structure of the thought. And that was really how Frege, what Frege thought he was doing. He said, well look, you have to like write down the sentences to, to because you have to have something concrete to work with. But really, what we're interested in is the thought. So really, he was interested in the, the, the mental representation. Um, OK, so now, that, that's an example of the kind of uh, progress that can, 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 can be made by using uh, these, these tools and this, this verticality conditions framework. Um, and and Fodor, in his book, The Language of Thought, he said, look, this is, we've got to basically take this on board. We have to. Um, you know, treat this mental language as having something like the logical structure that, that Frege posited. And that looks plausible, you know, when you're uh, talking about high-level beliefs and intentions and desires. It starts to look less plausible when you look at, you know, a cognitive map being used by a bat or a rat. Or when you look at some perceptual representation of a red sphere being used by the perceptual system. A lot of people said, look, you know, that doesn't look like there's any kind of logical structure in place. Logic looks like the province of some kind of higher faculty of reason that just isn't available necessarily, say, to you know, a rat or to the perceptual system. So one of the main issues in the philosophy of representation and the science of representation is what kind of other representational formats could there be? So for example, um, uh, you know, if you look in everyday life, I, I, I mentioned Sentences at the beginning of the talk, but I also mentioned like pictures, diagrams, maps, um, <coughs> calendars, you know, music notation. There are lots of different kinds of representational formats that we use, and they, they don't look like they have logical structures. So one of the main ideas you see in cognitive science is looking for, you know, what kind of other representational formats could there be, like cognitive maps, for example, or um, causal diagrams, like diagrams of the causal structure of different um, events or variables. Um, but this is, you know, a really thorny question that I'm really just sort of flagging because it, it's, no, no one really knows how to think about this question in, in a really systematic, satisfying way. Not, I mean, not many people, including me, have, you know, written about it, but it's, it's sort of, we don't have a great overall framework for comparing different representational formats and, you know, what does it mean to say that you have different formats at work and how would you empirically investigate uh, which format does it work in a different case. All right, last point I just want to um, mention is um, sort of the, the Another um, issue that's moved very large in the uh, philosophical literature, which is a question called the uh, problem of intentionality. Um, and this, uh, this problem reflects the idea that um, there's something quite mysterious about the mind's representational faculties. So, you know, this water bottle doesn't represent anything. You know, there's trees out there, they don't represent anything. Most things in the world don't represent anything. But what is it, what is it about our brains that make them represent something? So, you know, for example, right now, I, let's say I, I, I'm thinking about the emperor of Tiberius. You know, I believe that Tiberius was a Roman emperor. Well, what makes it the case that I'm thinking about Tiberius right now? How is like, my brain state able to stretch all the way back to Tiberius? Why am I thinking about him as opposed to some other Roman? I, I, you know, or let's say that I form an intention to go to the post office. Well, why is that intention about the post office and not like the gym or the grocery store? Like, what, what makes it the case that I'm thinking about the post one thing as opposed to the other? All right, so that, that's like the problem of intentionality. Intentionality is it's just, it's just another word for representationality. So it's just kind of a convention in the philosophical literature that in this context it's called intentionality. The most common way that people have sought to solve the problem of intentionality is to reduce the intentional to the non-intentional. And the idea is, look, take some representational property, like, you know, you're thinking about Tiberius right now. Take that property of thinking about Tiberius. We're going to look for something that we can describe like in physical terms or biological terms, or anyway, not in representational terms, which will basically be equivalent to thinking about Tiberius. So we're going to try to reduce the property of thinking about Tiberius to, think, to something that can be specified using non-representational vocabulary. 
So the idea is that intentionality has to ultimately be derivative from something that's physical or biological or neurophysiological. Or, anyway, something that's non-representational. So there's a famous quote from Fodor. <clears throat> Fodor says, um, if aboutness is real, it must be really something else. Um, <clears throat> all right, and then what you found, partly because of Fodor's influence, because you, you know, he was extraordinarily influential in philosophy of mind, in the, in the, especially in the 80s and 90s, was a lot of people really started to pursue this project of trying to reduce the intentional to the non-intentional. And this was a cottage industry in philosophy in the 80s and the 90s where people would give their theories of how this was supposed to work. These theories uh, did not work too well. Uh, they all have very serious problems and counterexamples, and you know, no, no one really knows how to solve the problems with them. So this was not a research program that bore much fruit, uh, in my judgment. And I, I think it's safe to say that at present we don't have any idea how you might successfully reduce the representational to the non-representational. So one idea that people had had in mind from the, from the start and that then started to seem a lot more salient with the, the lack of achievements of this reductionist program was, well, maybe we don't need to do a reduction. Maybe we should just take uh, representational notions as, as primitive notions and not try to reduce them to anything else. Um, I mean, everyone agrees, you know, somehow representational properties emerge from complex configurations of physical systems. Like, like, no one's saying it's like some sort of like, you know, spiritual like, stuff in addition to the physical universe. That's not the view. It's just that, yeah, it, it emerges in some complicated way, but that, it doesn't mean we can write down something in the language of physics or biology that specifies exactly what it is to be thinking about Tiberius or, you know, intend to go to the grocery store. So th this was a, a view that people started to take seriously, but another view that people also started to take seriously as they became disillusioned with this reductionist program was, well, maybe what this shows is we should get rid of representational notions altogether. Maybe Skinner had it right. And this was, this was again, a view that had been definitely a around in the philosophical literature, um, partly because of the influence of the philosopher W.V. Quine. So Quine was like really good friends with Skinner. They, we're in the Harvard Society of Fellows together, which is again, like a great bonding experience for them. But anyway, Quine was like really influenced by Skinner. And he was essentially, uh, you know, Skinnerian from the 1960s on. And Quine, you know, was the most important uh, philosopher in metaphysics and epistemology of the, you know, the second half of the 20th century. So he had enormous influence. Um, so this really gave a kind of cachet to this, this, this view that's now called eliminative materialism, which is basically, look, you know, representation is, is really just not a scientific notion. We shouldn't have it in our scientific theories. And many people influenced by Quine uh, promoted this view and continue to promote it in contemporary philosophy. And I, you know, in my opinion, this view, just this eliminativist view, is inconsistent with contemporary cognitive science practice, which, as I've been arguing to you, employs representational idioms right and left. And so if, you, if we were to follow Quine's lead and just try to expunge representationality from our theorizing, I, you know, I, I don't I think we could give even remotely adequate theories of perception, navigation, many, many other areas as, as well. I just mentioned these two. So, you know, I, I think that it, it's possible that we should uh, take the uh, primitivist position more seriously and, and not worry so much about trying to reduce the intentional to the non-intentional. Um, and that's a view that, for example, my, my colleague uh, Tyler Burge uh, over in the philosophy department defends in his uh, recent book, Origins of Objectivity, um, where he focuses especially on the case of perceptual psychology. It's a view that Fodor took more seriously early in, in his career, but then towards, by the 1980s, he, 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 he was more firmly in the re reductionist camp. Now, um, you know, I think it's also just instructive to, to look, you know, beyond cognitive science, because if you look beyond cognitive science, you see in, in most uh, so-called special sciences, sciences other than physics, you, um, you, you see various theoretical notions being appealed to where people don't worry about reducing them to notions from physics. So, you know, in economics, for example, you, you, the, obviously the notion of an interest rate is a very important notion for ec economics. But if you were to ask, you know, hey, what is it for an interest rate R 
should prevail in the economy right now. <laughs> like no one has any clue how to give a reductive an analysis of that. So does that mean like we shouldn't use the notion of an interest rate? I, I mean, that's like a laughable suggestion. You can't do economics without that notion. So you just need various notions to do various sciences. And I, I don't think we should worry so much about the reduction. The, the case that philosophers always cite in favor of reduction is chemistry. Because they have this idea in mind that chemistry was successfully reduced to physics through quantum mechanics. And that this shows that reduction is in principle possible, and that should be a model for other sciences. But I'm not convinced that that's a very good example because um, I, don't, I don't really, I'm not convinced that uh, you can reduce chemistry to physics in the way that many philosophers have claimed. So, for example, the notion of a chemical bond, it's not at all obvious that that can be explicated in, in purely physical terms. But, you know, try doing chemistry without the notion of a chemical bond, right? It's not, it's not going to be easy. So, um, anyway, chemistry side, it's clear that, you know, most sciences outside of physics uh, don't are reducible to, to other sciences. So I, I, I take this uh, reductionist um, position more seriously. Now, you know, it, it doesn't mean that we should give up on trying to say things to illuminate and explicate representationality. I, I think that um, you can say a lot to um, try to clarify representationality. I said, you know, a few things in the middle of my talk, and, you know, Tyler Burge in his book says a lot of stuff designed to illuminate perceptual representation in a non-reductive way. And you know, there's lots one could say. It just it doesn't have to take the form of a reduction of a reduction that so many philosophers have looked for. So I think that that's probably enough for me talking now. So why don't um, we open up the floor for for questions? Um, are you gonna? You, you've been feeling yourself much longer. Uh, you know, I want to use, because I just find it so stressful to know who to okay. call on next, so I, I think that, that might be like some kind of mental overload for me. So, okay. yeah. Thanks. Thanks for an interesting talk. Thank um, you. I wanted to ask you about the intentionality problem. Um, and uh, so it seems like a, a lot of the handling in that area has to do, uh, regarding reduction, has to do with the fact that the kinds of explanations that people are looking for are very proximate. They want to know what it is to have some property of this closed system that makes it representational. I was wondering if what you thought of the idea that you could appeal to historical processes, evolution, natural selection, things like that, yeah. Um, yeah. to help solve that problem, right? And I don't know if that would count as a form of reduction, but you could say something like what makes the brain representational is that it's an evolved system that is designed whatever yeah. language you want to use to represent. So, yes, I mean, I think that most philosophers, if they could reduce representationality to evolutionary biology, you know, those historical, you know, ideological information you're talking about, they would say, yes, that, that'll count. I'll take that as a reduction. Um, and people have tried to do that, for sure. So the first attempt to do, this, do that was a, a, a book called... Um, Language, Thought, and Other Biological Categories by Ruth Milcom. Um, so, and then she, throughout, that was in like the 80s, I think it was like 84 or something. Um, but it was you know, the mid 80s. And then, you know, she published many, many things throughout the rest of her career that um, were in that same general direction. Um, so, you know, one of the things that happened in the 90s was like there was this ongoing debate with, between Fodor and Millikan, and Fodor was really attacking Millikan, and then um, I think he did, you know, pretty successfully show that there were some problems with her. I mean, one of the things that I don't, I can't, I can't remember if Fodor talks about this one, but um, one, one of the problems that I see, because I actually published a paper about her, her, her thing, um, is that and I, I'm sorry, I'm just, at this point I'm making this original to me. Many people have made this point, including Burge and, and other people as well. But she, her, the, the way that she does it is like so ecumenical that like, for example, bacteria count as, as representing like really simple bacteria. So it just, it makes the notion of representation so broad that I think it's, it's, it's really something different from what is at issue in say perception or cognitive maps. It, it's, it's not that, that that might be one useful notion of representation, but for, for me, I, I want something that's a, a little a, a little more specialized. Um, now, there's a um, there's a book that actually just came out like like a day ago, which is um, trying to develop a Millikan type view. It, it's drawing on some of the considerations you're talking about. That's by a guy um, named Nicholas Shea, 
can't remember what it's called because it just just came out. But it's it you know, that that's a book that's developing a similar thing. But and then I guess um, Karen Neander, who um, she also has a military type view. So yeah, this is definitely like a view that's like out there, and it's not something I can just like you know review for you in like five minutes or something like that. But it's I I'll, I don't I don't think it's it's too promising because uh, I think that these views tend to be too ecumenical. And you also just get these sort of detailed counterexamples to them, which was more the kind of thing that Floater was focused on. But, but yes, if, if you could do that, that would count as a reduction. Okay. Cool. Um, I had a question which was um, about like, the idea of why can't you re just reduce natural representations to neural networks? And I think that that's a common like technique used by a lot of neuroscientists. Representing ideas with like a network of different ideas or different representations, maybe you could call them, um, yeah. <laughs> just is purely like a network of cells. Maybe we don't fully understand all parts of it, but then that could be reduced to just a network. Right. Yeah. No, I think I think you're right that a lot of people do think of it that way. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's a good question. Well, so I think that, you know, the neural networks are, are, are arguably going to be a part of a total story of what's going on. It's not that I think, oh, those have no place in the theory. But the, a reduction should give necessary and sufficient conditions. And I'm not sure you can do that if all you have is a neural network. Um, because, I mean, for example, like, like think about you know the Tiberius example, right? I mean, if all you do is like look at the internal neural networks, how are you going to get out of that that it's you know Tiberius as opposed to some other ancient Roman? It's surely got something to do with like causal chains back to you know back back historically someone interacted with Tiberius and it was like that guy and not some other guy. And then, you know, we then had the linguistic practice of referring to Tiberius with the name Tiberius, and then I was exposed to that name. I, so I, then I picked up the ability to refer to Tiberius from, you know, being exposed to that name. So my, my ability to represent that guy as opposed to some other ancient Roman or some other, you know, some person from some other country, it, it, it doesn't just have to do with the stuff that's contained within my, you know, my skin. It's got to do with how I'm more um, <coughs> embedded in the external environment, including the social environment. So it, it's sort of hard to see how if all you have is the internal neurophysiological stuff that you're going to be able to get all of the representational aspects of, of the mind. Now some people have said, well, then those parts don't matter, the external parts. All that really matters for explanation is the stuff that be, can be reconstructed on the basis of the internal neurophysiological processing. And that's actually been like a huge debate in philosophy for, gosh, now like 40 years about if that's right or not. So yeah, I mean, I think you've put your finger on, on an issue. I mean, I mean, there's sort of, there's how much of representation can you reconstruct just in terms of the internal neurophysiological stuff? And then what's left out of that? And a lot of the debates have to do with how important this is stuff that would be left out if you had that kind of neurophysiological reconstruction. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, so I, I kind of, I'm in line with the past two questions, which is, um, firstly, two-part question. What kind of um, reductionism do you really have in mind here? Because a limited materialism is on one extreme. And then you have also, it sounds like you're kind of talking about some kind of supervenience that would satisfy your understanding. And then the second part I wanted to add was, what about some type of complex adaptive system, which didn't look for one reductive element but instead took in multiple accounts of constituents interacting with feedback, because then you could have a phylogenetic history that would help you understand how different species have evolved with abstractions. Um, and then also the constituent parts, such as 
neurophysiology, networks in the brain, um, and these kind of things. So somewhere in there, maybe, yeah. is, is the theory or idea that you have, and um, yeah. I guess where, what you're thinking uh, between those. So in terms of reduction, um, the, the first part of your question. So super B is uh, just, it's, it's um, but maybe not everyone knows what that is. Um, so you would basically say that like one kind of property supervenes on another kind of property. Pro pro a, a, property A supervenes on property B if the only way to change A is to change B. So in other words, you can't have a change in A without a change in B. So for example, um, here's, a, here's like a plausible view, not necessarily right, but just, just to illustrate the concept of supervenes. Which computer program a program is running supervenes on, you know, the, the behavior of the, the silicon chips that make it up? So you couldn't, like, change what computer program it's running. Like, you couldn't change the, that, the fact that it's running from, that it's running, you know, Microsoft Word to that it's doing a chess program without changing something about the activity of the silicon chips that make up the computer. That's what it would be to say that the computer program supervenes on the internal hardware. So I think that at a minimum, if you did a reduction, you would have to have supervenience. So if, if you want, but it wouldn't necessarily be supervenience on the internal neurophysiology for the reason you said in your second question, because it, 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 the supervenience base could be not just the internal stuff, as I was Say the response to the first one, but it could be all the stuff that you two were talking about. But it ultimately would have to supervene on something non-physical. So sorry, something like physical or biological. But that's not really enough for a reduction. Mere supervenience doesn't give you reduction. So that, that's one of the main differences between supervenience and reduction is that su supervenience is, is like very, very weak in a way. Because see, reduction is like, here's the thing I want to reduce. Like, you know, X is thinking about Tiberius. You know, Michael is thinking about Tiberius. Now, here is my reduction of that, which is like Michael has some complicated physical, neurophysiological, biological property, and they have to they have to be able to like write that down, and then it's a necessary and sufficient condition. That's like way beyond supervenience to be able to, to do that. So, I mean, one of the things that people su suggested in this philosophical literature is, well, we can't do reduction, but we can do supervenience, and you sort of still get some kind of like connection between the mental and the physical by supervenience, but it's not reductive. So I, I, I wouldn't count mere supervenience thesis as any kind of reduction. That, that, that's, that, that's not what any scientist would ever consider a, a, a true reduction. Um, in terms of your second um, question, like, look, I'm not, like, it's not like part of my like, view that like, reduction is impossible or something like that. That's, like, I'm not like committed. It's just that the reductions people have given haven't worked. You know, I mean, this is like, people worked hard on it, it didn't work. So I, I'm really just saying, are you so sure that you should be committed to reduction as a prerequisite for admitting representationality into your theorizing? Because it looks like you can't do the theorizing without the representationality, and it's not obvious that reduction could occur. Like, if you've got, like, here's my idea, I'm going to combine all the aspects of the complex system into a reduction, I say, Godspeed, you know, go go for it. I'm not like I'm not like trying to like stop people from doing that. It's just like I, I'm more just looking at the track record and saying this is not something I'm going to spend my time on. Yeah, because I'm, I'm more interested in you know trying to highlight the explanatory theor theoretical role that representationality plays and trying to say things that clarify it. But I, I think if you take the reduction reductive thing as your starting point, you're what I have observed from this literature is you just get led into a lot of red herrings and dead ends. And you just get start to get, I mean, if you just, I, you seem like you're familiar with this the literature. So, I mean, if you just look at this literature of like, this, it's like some of Fodor's worst stuff. It's like his stuff on reduction, because it's just like, it's just all these kind of like examples and like weird things that like don't seem to have anything to do with like what we really started out caring about, which is like how the mind works. So, you know. That, that's my, my take on it. But I, still, I don't like have some argument that it's impossible. I, I don't know how to, I don't think such an argument would even be possible. Hi, um, thanks. Um, I, so I, I'm a little familiar with some of that literature. And I was wondering if there have been reductionist accounts put forward that posit 
something that is fundamentally just relational about you know representation and an interpreter or something like that, and that as being uh -huh. the, the person interpreting the, the mental state. Or I, mean, I don't think it has to be a person necessarily, uh -huh. but representation is being constituted by some array of things and some process or other thing that bears that relation to that thing. Oh, I see. Right. Yeah, I mean, that was like a photo was doing. It was more like, it was more the causal and, and law-like relations between the mind and the thing that's being represented. So, like, it was like, why is your mental state about cats? It's because, like, you know, whenever you see a cat, you enter into that mental state. That was like the answer. So there's like a causal connection between the mental state that represents cats and then the cat. But, I mean, obviously what I just said is, like, not right, you know? So it's not, or like, if you can think about cats when there's no cat there. So it... But clearly that's not right. So the problem is like, sure, you start out with this idea there's like a correlation between the mental state and, and the, the worldly state, but then the simplistic thing isn't correct. So then how do you revise it? And then you just get into all these attempts to revise it to make it more plausible. But yeah, I mean, that, 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 that was what most people were, 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 were pursuing. It was related to your question, because they were like, look, the really important thing is not the neurophysiological thing. It's, it's more the thing out of the world that's, that's represented. That was Fodor's view. I mean, you had other views that thought the more internal stuff was more important. I mean, as I say, it was one of the debates. But, but, but a lot of these views were like trying to look for causal connections between some, the mind and the world. Well, I, I guess what I'm saying is not about you know positing the aboutness as being in the mind or out in the world or something. But as yeah. as you know, if there's a if there's a project of naturalizing intentionality, right. I'd say that there is an outness <coughs> somewhere that it's not even necessarily a causal chain from you know, something out in the world to the thought, but as being, representation as being a, not situated here or there, but as sort of the collective interaction of the representer and the represented. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, well, by collective, you mean like lots of people or? I'm, Just or? something that can, have this bear a particular relationship to itself, and that is it's sort of the system of whatever is there and whatever is bearing that relation to yeah. that thing. Yeah, so I mean, you, you definitely have views where, like, um, some kind of external interpreter interpreting the mental states of the person uh, is helps to constitute the mental state. So like Donald Davidson at uh, Berkeley, um, he had a view sort of called interpretivism, but it doesn't really have a reductive form because if you bring in the mental states of the interpreter, then you haven't reduced anything because then you're talking about the ascription of the representational properties to the other system. So it wasn't, it was, it was conceived like an elucidation, but not an interpretation. But yeah, I mean, you had, you had definitely had views that, that emphasized more that collective aspect. That being the most famous example. Thank you so much. Thank you. Along with many themes which have been discussed so far, but one crucial issue is that in this whole dynamics of representation and reality, whether there is an assumption of fixity or the whole process is dynamic. And if we build on both, for example, Buddhist thought. Build on, sir, but Buddhist thought. You know, oh, okay. The whole dynamic nature of reality and flux, and a kind of, when you see, non-fixity, and also in quantum mechanics also, you know. So this is one thing to meditate about. The second thing relating to your thought about the collective, and I would like to make it relational and ecological. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, this whole ecological way of representation also faces the question of dualism. Dualism. And because uh, at the root of all these things is the issue of pervasive dualism. The, the what dualism? The issue of pervasive. Oh, pervasive dualism. Right. In many system, many traditions of thinking. Right. Do you mean like mind body dualism? Yes, and oh. also the whole representation and reality, and you know. Right. So once we kind of problematize dualism and move towards non dual way of thinking and, and understanding reality, 
This also brings the question of what kind of representation. For example, in philosophy, there is a very in interesting distinction between mimetic representation and artistic representation. Now, we are not just talking about mimetic representation. There are varieties of ways of artistic representation. And if human beings, including all beings, have a kind of an artistic dimension, and so this is to think about. And finally, of course, the limits of representation. That means how do we look at representation with its inbuilt limits? With what limits? Inbuilt limits? Inbuilt limits of representation right. itself. The but what sort of limits did you, did you Like the very, the very representative activity itself okay. has its own inbuilt limitations to represent something. I see. Though it represents, you know. So then uh, how do we move ahead yeah. with thinking about representation? Right. Acknowledging the inbuilt limitations built into it. So, so the, sorry, the limit is it can only represent what, which is, I just didn't catch it, sorry, to say what the limit is again. I just like there is an inbuilt limitations to the representative activity itself. Right, I got that, but then what is the, what are the limitations? That was the part I, I just didn't. Okay, catch. I mean, for example, in sociocultural reality. Ah. Uh -huh. You know, you refer to this example of the elections, for example. Right. Now, if we build, uh, build on from that kind of an uh, representative, right. now in part where the representative can represent the constituency. Now, there is a fundamental limit to the representative representing the constituency. Okay. But building from there, we can also look at other activities of representation. While it represents, but there is an inbuilt limitation to the capacity of representation. Yeah, I mean, I certainly agree with you. There are limits to what we can represent. I mean, for sure. I mean, like, I mean, you could just, if you look at, like, you know, a, like a rat, you know, it can represent its spatial layout. Um, can it represent, you know, the property of being a carburetor or an electron? Probably not. That's probably not available to it. So, you know, there's certainly limits on what. Um, lower mammals can represent them. and I, there are obviously you know limits on what we can represent too so I think you're right that's something one needs to be sensitive to I, I don't have like some general answer of how to deal with that just that you have to be aware of it um, I think that in terms of the, the dualism question um, uh, you know I, I I think most contemporary philosophers think that Descartes was wrong about dualism and we shouldn't be mind body and I, you know, I certainly think he was wrong about that. I mean, I think that. So, I mean, I, I do think that. You know, ultimately, we're dealing here with, with brain states, with neurophysiological states, and it's just that the states come to acquire um, very complex properties, representational properties, through all the factors that everyone has been mentioning. You know, the the internal neurophysiological activity, the the evolutionary stuff, the historical causal chains, all, all the in some cases the collective, all, all of it. It's a either depending on the case, it, it but ultimately the, the the base of it is, is, is brain states. It's just the brain states have extremely complicated properties because they're embedded in this, in this very complex system. But I don't think we should posit some kind of like, you know, soul stuff or some kind of like immaterial substance in order to make sense of that. I don't think Descartes was right about that. Uh, in terms of the world changing, the dynamic aspect, I, um, I I agree with you. I think that's like crucial to handle. And you're right that the, the cases I was talking about were sort of more of a non-dynamic aspect. Like you're just like seeing, hey, what color is the sphere right now? But of course, if you have a case like an like an object that's moving, then you gotta like track it visually. So I mean, that that's that's a more complicated kind of modeling task where. You know, you could have, like, for example, a soccer ball, and then how do you track the position of the soccer ball? And that—that's you can give a Bayesian model of that, but that's hard. That's a hard task to do. I mean, but but I, I absolutely agree with you. The Bayesian, the, the the dynamic aspect is is absolutely vital for understanding um, for for understanding you know how these mental processes work. I, I think that sometimes people. Um, in some of this literature have wanted to cite the dynamical aspect 
to argue that the kinds of representational models I've wanted to give can't succeed. And I, I don't think those arguments are very convincing. I think that you know they show that you have to incorporate a, a dynamical aspect into the models. And it's true that often people, when they give the most simple models, they don't have a dynamical aspect. So I agree it's a factor that needs to be incorporated. But you know, if you look like in a lot of, for example, the so-called dynamical systems theory, a lot of the arguments there are like, we shouldn't have a representationalist perspective because it can't handle the dynamic aspects. We have to go to dynamical systems. And I, I just don't think that's right. I think that you can, you know, you can give, as I said, like Bayesian models that incorporate a dynamic aspect. They exist and they're success successful. Um, I was wondering if you could sketch out, like, um, let's say you're in the camp of somebody who's convinced that there is evidence for some sort of mental representation going on. And the argument isn't, um, can it be reduced or not to, to some neurophysiological level, but that, that you're interested in developing different variants of types of representational uh, uh, models being instantiated in, 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 in the mind. So what, what and, th and then that gives you some ability to make predictions, let's say, about at the behavioral level. Can you sketch a couple of different <coughs> attitude, different approaches to that? Like, can you? Are there examples of people who get inspiration from somewhere? Maybe computer science, maybe oh. other That's lines of evidence to say, well, okay, there is a representational system at work here. Maybe right. it's like this, or maybe it's like that. I see. And then is is that part of your research agenda, or is that like a different? Um, right. Oh, that absolutely, example? 100 that you've okay. described my position and okay. what I'm <coughs> to do, yeah, yeah. But you're asking, like, what are the sort of some of the different schools of thought that exist yeah. within that umbrella? Yeah, I'm just wondering where the, where the inspiration comes yeah. from yeah. and no. what, kinds of, uh, what kinds of behavior, behavioral examples might, might lend credence to, to one Well, you, you mentioned one of the main inspirations, which is yeah. computer science. So, I mean, in the, the advent of, of cognitive science, one of the the main driving forces behind it was the so-called computational theory of mind, which pictured the mind as a kind of computing system. So I don't know if you know about like Turing machines, but it's a very abstract, idealized model of a computing system. It's basically the, sort of one of the foundational notions for computer science. But that was one of the ideas that um, Fodor was really pushing in his book, was that our best cognitive science theories view the mind as a sort of Turing machine, so basically a kind of computing system. And that, I think that was a pretty fair description of the, the work that was going on in that period. Um, then you mentioned uh, neural, neural networks, uh, and that, that, then that, this sort of called connectionist uh, uh, movement then became bigger in the 1980s. And that's really sort of an alternative computational formalism. Um, so it sort of differs in a lot of ways from the Turing machine, because the Turing machine is like, well, it, it's like, um, you basically like have a memory tape and a processor that moves along the memory tape and can erase and write symbols on the memory tape. So it's basically how a desktop computer works in very simplified terms. Whereas the neural networks were supposed to be kind of more brain-like. They had sort of these nodes that were sort of like neurons and connections between them that were sort of like synapses. So people thought that looked more neurophysiologically plausible. Now the actual connections and connections networks people gave weren't very neurophysiologically plausible at all. But but it, it, it maybe looked a little more plausible than the Turing side models. And then, you know, now the more recent modeling tends, tends to be, people don't really call it connectionism anymore. It's more like just computational neuroscience, partly because it, it's getting more neurophysiologically realistic. So the, the, those are like some of the schools of thought. And then the Bayesian school of thought is a more recent development. I mean, Bayesian decision theory is all, but the idea of using it to give these empirical models. So, I mean, for example, one of the things that this highlights is, is how mechanistic should the models be. Because if you look at these like computational style models, the idea is you're really trying to treat the mind as like a machine. And like here are the parts and here's how the parts fit together. Whereas the Bayesian model is a lot less mechanistic. It's like here's this prior probability and I'm not going to tell you anything about the underlying algorithms that, you know, the, pro the probability figures in that, that um, underwrite the Bayesian inference. I'm just giving a very abstract description. So one of the debates is how mechanistic should a representational theory be? Mm -hmm. 
So those are some of the debates that come up. And then uh, one of the things I sort of alluded to in my talk, it's, it's an example of what you're talking about, is if you accept the representational picture, like what kinds of mental representation are there? Or what kind of different formats are yeah. there? So that's another big dividing line. So th those are some of the issues that sort of what kinds of formats are there? What kinds of processes do the representations figure in? And then I think you asked about the phenomena. So I think that, you know, you know, the language case was a huge case, in the, especially in the early cognitive science. I mean, the, the, the success of generative linguistics really um, convinced a lot of people that you needed a more mentalistic perspective. And so that case and perception, I think, are the two cases that are the, the most successful, where you have the most aggressive explanations, with uh, motor control maybe being the third. So motor control being like, how am I able to like reach and pick up this water bottle? So you have pretty impressive theories of that. So those are probably the areas where, if, the, if you say, give me the phenomena that should convince me that you need a representational treatment, those are, those are probably the points. Maybe one more? Uh, so all of the examples you gave, it seems like there's a pretty clear phenomenon out there for the representation to be right or wrong of. Um, but you mentioned generative grammar. Uh, it's much less clear in this case that there is anything like that. So a lot of the machinery that generative is used even things like verb phrase or noun phrase, but you know, unarticulated, uh, unarticulated expressions and all of this sort of structure, it's much less hard to get a sense of what that out in the world is representing, whether it could be right or wrong about that. Do you, does that sound like a r correct characterization of generative grammar? If so, does that show that these linguists aren't using a representational theory? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, I, I agree that it's not something like, like some, like just, property out there in the physical world. It, it's more of a, um, a social property. But I think that, you know, these um, utterances really do have constituents. The constituents really do have syntactic categories, like noun phrase, verb phrase. There really are unarticulated constituents. These, these theoretical postulates are describing an actual reality, real features of the utterances. And then the subpersonal syntactic system mentally represents those features of the um, the utterances and it may do so correctly or incorrectly. So you may have the wrong phrase structure tree for some utterance. I mean we're pretty good at it, right? But but you may you may get it right or wrong. Um, so I do think that there's a question of you, you have to distinguish between the you have, uh, I don't know if you know Alexander George's paper on how to think but I mean it's a sort of line that he pushes, but uh, how to think about Trump Chomsky and linguistics or something like that. Um, but he's got all these distinctions but about, but, that, but the sort of the essence of it is there's the mental representation of the grammar and then there's the grammar itself and the mental representation of the syntactic structure and the syntactic structure itself. So I, I think that's a good distinction. I think it's a good way of looking at it. And I think you do get something like veridicality conditions out of it if you, if you look at it that way. But I will concede to you that it's a somewhat uh, less natural way of looking at it. And I think that's certainly not how Fodor was looking at it, uh, or how Chomsky was looking at it. But it's how George looks at it, though. He's much, much less famous than Chomsky and Fodor. Okay, thank you. That's all we have time for.